Welcome to the RSM COVID series, uh, COVID-19 series. Gosh, I've forgotten what date it was. Uh, this one is media in a health crisis. How timely is the session? I don't know how many of you were listening to yesterday's Dominic Cummings session during the Health and Social Care and Science Committees, uh, but there was one thing that we picked up was um, the question from Conservative MP Luke Evans how he rated the government's communications at the height of the pandemic. I have my own particular thoughts on this, um, but our panel will also have them. He, Dominic Cummings, replied that some of those working in communications for Downing Street were the best in people, best people in the world, and that one of the great myths was that bad comms was to blame for the government, government's mishandling of the pandemic. He said, fundamentally, the reason for all these problems was bad policy, bad decisions, bad planning and bad operational capability. All, all massive allegations, of course. Uh, I am expecting a lively session with lots of questions and you can put your quest questions in the normal box and you can upvote them so I can see which are the most popular ones. But let me first of all introduce myself. I'm Victoria MacDonald. I'm the health and social care editor for Channel 4 News and very pleased to be doing this session. Um, and joining me will be Professor Ivan Brown, who is Director of Public Health in Leicester. Conveniently for us, was at the eye of a storm only this week. Robin McKee, the absolute brilliant science and environment editor for The Observer, a must read every Sunday. And Dr. David Oliver, consultant in geriatrics and general internal medicine at the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust, uh, a long-standing weekly columnist for the BMJ and writes in newspapers and news sites, as well as being a very witty uh, tweeter uh, and, um, and has also regularly appeared on Channel 4 News. So I just want to start with each of you giving a short overview of what your overriding experience has been reporting on or working with the media during this pandemic. And I wonder if I could start with you, Ivan. Well, thank you very, very much, Victoria. Uh, I, I think my, my overriding uh, recollection, I think, of the media was really back last year when Leicester was the first area that was put into uh, a local lockdown. And I think with all of our training, we we get some training around, you know, the traditional media training. Uh, but what really struck me was I was standing in, in front of a, um, you know, a, a, a lectern and it was like something out of the UN. There were microphones all over the place, people from all, all over different parts of the world, different media sources, cameras, all sorts of things. Uh, and I really realised that what was happening here was not something that was sort of your average local news story but this was not it was beyond national it was international uh, and therefore being able to convey a very clear message and a very clear uh, position statement became really really very important so i think that was my my overriding one and my second one i would say is probably been uh, the, the 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 challenges that you have between communicating at the national level uh, and communicating at the local level. Sometimes they are, they're, they're not the same and the messages are different and the questions are quite different uh, as well. So that will be my starter for 10. Uh, that's a good start. And, and I remember very clearly being there that day and um, you were, we can come back to this, but of course you had the, politic, the politician beside you and you were trying to be very measured and trying to say, this is the issue, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. Um, and uh, you were very patient, I have to say. Um, Robin, can I come to you and ask you that same question? It's really, it's about um, how you have uh, found um, your, your sort of overriding experience on reporting uh, on this during the pandemic. And I mean, particularly about dealing, I would say, with, with government um, comms and, and perhaps uh, trying to weave your way through um, the, the bombardment we all had of the science, of the data. Um, just how, how, has your, how has your past 14 or 15 months been? Um, well, I, I suppose I should be grateful in one sense in that never have I been more at the centre of the uh, 
of the operations of, of, of my newspaper. Science has never been more important than it has been over the last 15 months. Um, and so it was it was good to be closely involved. And I've got to, my, my particular paper took um, what I said very, very seriously. Um, it has been a it's been a very rocky ride, um, or indeed, as you say, bombarded with of information and trying to find, a, pick a path through through it when all the time you actually wanted to downplay the threat because you felt threatened you, yourself. Um, and the, the the way round it, I have I've found best was to actually deal directly with scientists and to cut as many of the middlemen out as possible. And I mean really, really grateful to people like Adam Finn and many, many others who always find the time privately to speak to me. So it's been trying to find a way uh, in lockdown to get to the people that matters. Uh, that has been the hard the hard task, um, but I've enjoyed doing it. Thank you, Robin. Um, do I take it that you weren't on Dominic Cummings' speed dial list then? I was not. I was not. Um, no, no, we, we don't exchange Christmas cards or anything like that. No, um, I've, I've not had much to do with Downing Street directly, I've got to say. Yeah, yeah, I didn't seem to have been on his list either. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, let me come to you. And um, you, you've, of course, seen it quite often from the other side. And I just wonder how you have dealt with it, but also it would be interesting to pick up some observations from you about how perhaps it could have been, what, 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 what worried you about the way the media was handling it? Okay, well, f first thing is uh, Victoria and I were uh, both at the same Nuffield Trust Health Policy Summit in the last week of February, which was a week before the first death in this country. And I looked after COVID patients pretty much nonstop throughout all three waves. I looked after a 28-bedded acute ward, and I was looking after people who were dying from COVID a week after that Nuffield Trust Summit. And Victoria and I will remember that um, the entire press corps were only allowed one question to each of Simon Stevens, uh, Matt Hancock, and Chris Whitty about COVID. And the whole thing was being played down and minimized. And I think at the time, uh, the journalists had very good instincts about the fact that this was a much bigger story than uh, the officials were letting on. My entire BMJ output got repurposed for about a year uh, writing about COVID. And the BMJ made all of its COVID content free. And I wrote about it in other specialist healthcare publications, but I was in a lot of demand from all the national uh, papers to do kind of doctor rights type of pieces and from byline times to do myth debunking. But apart from what I was doing on the record in my own name, I was absolutely hounded for requests for broadcast media. Uh, and I didn't want to do most of them because I thought there were too many people whose own ego uh, was a, and journalist charm was allowing them to go and talk outside their area of expertise. But I also know if you, if you look at uh, doctors in the media during the pandemic, the people who appeared were academics or people with a political axe to grind or people representing specialist societies, or they were GPs or independent contractors, because it was very hard for your jobbing employed doctor in England to actually get on the airwaves. And you'll notice there was a, a change of approach in the second wave, letting the cameras in. The Welsh were a bit less controlling, but I've got lo lots of contacts in medicine about people who are told explicitly not to speak in the media, not to go on social media, comms directors who felt they couldn't put uh, messages out to the local population and so I spent a lot of time as well doing uh, off the record uh, briefings to journalists for background uh, or to steer them to good spokespeople but a lot of them were very frustrated that they couldn't get medics to talk on the record and the cameras weren't allowed uh, in so and I suppose in social media terms I've, I've got engaged in quite a lot of scraps and myth debunking with uh, some of the denialists for all, for all the good it's done me. But I've had a, a, a kind of mixed uh, mixed experience of it all. I think that's very interesting because of course we were, um, we will, when this is all, when we go over it at the end, well, I mean, I think some of us have said it now, is that the, the tight central control on comms led to a lot of difficulties and particularly in the first and second um, beginning of the second wave where we were being told by people like you this is terrible 
this is, you know, our hospitals are filling up and, and we weren't allowed in, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. NHS England said, uh, you know, nobody was allowed to speak to anybody. And it, and I feel, I don't know if you agree, that it, that it distorted the, the vision at the beginning of what was happening. Yeah, I mean, I think we know from endless social attitude surveys that levels of trust in doctors, nurses, frontline health professionals is high. And if they'd allowed people who are doing their job and seeing what was going on on the ground um, to talk from personal experience, I think that would have been good. And also, if you, if you look at, for instance, the roster of GPs that do BBC Breakfast, they're very used to interpreting complex information and explaining it in plain English to the general public. And I think they've done a great job. So I think it was counterproductive because it made it look like uh, the politicians and the officials had... Um, something to hide and also because all healthcare is local people want to know what's going on in their local hospital and their local health economy and and it stopped people from being able to engage with that, that local information including by the way some really good news stories about innovations in care and public reassurance that people uh, weren't allowed to put out there certainly in the first few months well, that, that comes nicely back to you, Ivan, about that different messaging between uh, local and national. So you were in the eye of the storm back then when Leicester was put into lockdown. And I remember you were, you were all quite taken by surprise by this news. Um, then again, we saw it on Monday where you were again taken by surprise by uh, this uh, national centralized edict that uh, there was not to be travel in and out of your areas unless it was essential and you so you had to deal with that on a national level but at the same time as you said you were having to get messages across at local level and I know from people that I've spoken to uh, that doctors were particularly concerned about the COVID deniers and that there was a feeling that that, that needed to be a local message. Do, do you feel that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so for me, the big thing is what locally people want to know what is happening. It's, it's, not, an, it's not an accusation. They just want to know what is happening. They're not interested in the story. They want to know what the local information is for their areas. So in order to do that effectively, you need to have the information, you need to have the data, and we need to be open with it because, you know, there is that, that saying that, that, you know, there is there is no public health without public trust. Uh, and you build that public trust by by sharing what you know at, at, the, at, at the appropriate time, as quickly as you can, really, once you're, you're satisfied with that. So we, we had that pressure of trying to share local information, um, making sure that it's accurate, but particularly during those periods of lockdown or, or, or whatever, we, we, were, we were riding against the tide. So you'd have a national narrative that was saying, uh, we're all coming out of this and you know restrictions are easing and that sort of thing. But we were having to talk to our local populations and say, okay, I know that's the national message, but the local message is this. And sometimes the sheer power and weight of the national message made it incredibly difficult for that local message to, to land. And we had to find new ways of doing things. So we were, you know, there was a lot of things like making sure we were using our local radio stations, local webinars set up at a kind of GP or uh, level to be able to talk to people so that people could say, could, could respond um, uh, against some of the, the information that they were receiving elsewhere. So, and I think also one of the challenges for us in Leicester particularly had, had been, you know, there is a, I feel like, you know, there's almost a convenience that, you know, there's Leicester on the naughty step. Why have you not got this sorted? When clearly uh, those that knew more closely recognise that there are areas where there are complexities that are all challenging, which mean that they might not fall in line with what was happening nationally, but trying to explain that to people. Um, and I think things like, you know, pieces that have been done in the BMJ, et cetera, really try to make people understand that, you know, there are complexities, which means that we don't all operate in the same way at the same time. Uh, and you have to understand history and locality to really tell the story effectively. Robin, 
I want to pick up just there on um, something you said and which Ivan has, has just brought up as well as that need for information, public trust and reliable data. Now, uh, we said, I said at the beginning, you know, we, there was a bombardment of information, particularly at the beginning and all through it. And you were trying to weave your way through and know who you should be listening to. I mean, in some ways, what happened yesterday with Dominic Cummings throws all that back up in the air again. And we, you know, were we being lied to where we're not getting the right information tell me just expand for me on why you took the decision to sort of avoid that side of it and go straight to your sources Pre previous um previous experiences with uh centralized comms and government comms has led me not to trust them particularly they manipulate they try to control and don't necessarily illuminate uh what you need to find out. Um, I, so I went elsewhere. I've got to say straight away that I was aided admirably by the Science Media Centre, which has had a sterling uh, COVID, uh, as it were. Um, and they were helpful in suggesting people and slowly built up the contacts I needed for this particularly new uh, this new story that was, was going through. I mean, going back to what Dominic Cummings said yesterday, I went through um, this sort of history of all the stories I've written uh, over the past, well, almost 18 months now about COVID. And my political editor, Toby Helm, and I were saying most of what Dominic Cummings said more than a year ago um, and about the catastrophic mistakes that were being made. Um, so it's, in a sense, it's, it's taken Dominic Cummings a long time to admit the truth. Uh, which, oh, his version of the truth, should I say? Um, it's 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 been a learning curve, put it that way. Yes, indeed. And um, have you ever felt that your narrative was being too controlled centrally? Did you ever get the phone calls from NHS England or the Department of Health or Public Health England saying, you know, why are you writing this? Why have you said this? No. I haven't. I would have got short shrift if they had. Um, uh, so no, no, I've got to give them the, the due there. We've got plenty of complaints from about our coverage from mostly from deniers and people like that. But that again, that doesn't worry me. Um, I want to put a question that's come up here um, that's just all oh, suddenly risen to the top. To what extent do the panel feel that the media contribute to increased anxiety and to some extent panic about the pandemic? Let me ask you, since I've got you there, Robin, what do you think mm. about that? Um, to a certain extent, yes, it does. But to, you've got to balance it off. I mean, look at the splash on the Sunday Telegraph uh, this, this Sunday. Vaccine is great. It's looking good. It just depends which narrative, the particular political point you want to make, how scary you can be. Um, but yes, I mean, when things are bad and you're in the middle of lockdown and you just get incessant bad news about cases rising and deaths rising, yes, you are guilty. Or and it depends on what you mean by guilt, but you certainly are increasing certain tension in the public. But then there was something to worry about, after all. I think that the, one of the issues that we found was that, that after a while we had huge viewership and then towards the summer it completely, you know, fell because people just couldn't take any more of this news anymore yeah. and that you had to become cognizant of the fact that the nation was feeling quite traumatised by it. And I'm sure it was the same in the papers. I mean, Ivan, you were, you were in some ways, of course, without any control over what the media was saying, but do, did you feel the idea that, that it might be contributing to that anxiety? Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I think so, um, in, in certain parts. So but often it came with a byline. Uh, I think the ones that I found most difficult, and you can almost pick it up at the beginning of the interview as to those that were going to, you know, share the story and let you know what's happening and those that sort of had an agenda. Uh, and those that started with the agenda of, you know, isn't it all terrible? What are you going to do about it? And this is, you know, you knew that they were looking for a particular a particular narrative that they wanted to build into a story. It's almost, you know, I know that journalists sometimes say, you know, find me a, a big a big story a day or, or whatever. And you felt sometimes you were going to be the big story 
no matter what you said. Uh, but I think that the, the, the better ones were like, what's happening? Can we get underneath this? Can you help us to understand why, you know, it, it continues in Leicester or you go up and you go down? Those, I always feel that we have to answer honestly and, 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 and share that because I look through the lens of, of the people that are going to be listening to that from Leicester. Uh, and and I, my view is they, they, they're going to want to know, and that's reasonable. But when it's built on top uh, and almost uh, inflated, I, I, find, I always found that really difficult uh, because I'd spend my time then trying to sort of undo a bit of that, that, that narrative that people have had in their minds. Just let me pick up a little bit on what happened this week, because uh, there were many of us who, who would have liked to have interviewed you on Monday and it thought that, that none of the directors of public health actually did come out and speak uh, at that point. Was that because you were told not to? Was it because you thought that you would stray into? So this is where the government appeared to have told you that you were all the eight areas with the, the highest rates of the of the variants were um, in a sort of their own little lockdown. What what happened then that you all felt that you couldn't come out and speak publicly, go on TV? So I think right at the beginning, at the beginning of that, it was quite simply, Victoria, which we had not been told. Uh, and so uh, what the, the, the first and the most pressing uh, task was to find out what were this, was this about? Because I think this, this issue about trust, um, you have to make sure that when you're going to speak, that you, you, you know what you're speaking about, because actually you can, you can do more harm. Um, and this was, this was uh, you know, it wasn't a situation of, of politics. It was a situation of us as directors of public health. We hadn't spoken to each other, interestingly, uh, at, at, that, at that point. Um, but I think we must have all felt the same, which is what is going on? Let's find out what's going on so that when we do speak to our areas, we can tell them this is what has happened. So I think that that's probably where that, that came from. It was a bit of a stormy day, one of many. Just, just to put that to you, David, but I wanted to add in something that I've been talking in my own newsroom this morning about, and, and some of the questions are, um, are bringing this up as well, is that the difference between sort of the political journalists who are at the, for instance, at the Downing Street press conferences or being, uh, being allowed to ask a question at those press conferences and the health and science correspondents who would have asked very different questions. What do you think, how do you think that changed the narrative? Um, well, I, I think by and large, the specialist health and science correspondents on all of the, uh, the broadsheets and the, and the main broadcast outlets have done a fantastic job with explainers and mythbusters and documentaries and fact checking, but they've not been the people allowed to put the questions at the presses. And I, I'm guessing the press conferences are the more high profile uh, engagement events. And then, of course, who's reporting on um, debates in the House of Commons or on parliamentary uh, select committees? Again, it tends to be the non specialist, doesn't it? And I think inevitably, what is quite a technocratic and technical issue gets turned into um, sometimes scandal and uh, ideological point scoring, which isn't particularly helpful. I mean, if you take one example of the discharges to uh, care homes and then the outbreaks in care homes, there's a lot of complexity around that, that indeed people were transferred en masse untested in the spring because there wasn't enough testing capacity nationally. And the counterfactual of keeping them all in hospital for, for 10 a couple of weeks for a test wouldn't have been good either and might have put them at risk and we now know that some of the outbreaks were nothing to do with hospital transfers but agency staff working on multiple sites or staff not being supported to um, uh, have time off isolating and of course underlying structural problems in the care home sector we also know that uh, care home residents often don't do very well if they're put into hospital when they're acutely sick and dying and yet that gets turned into by general news correspondents or particularly political correspondents into uh, bad government uh, decision making. You know, is it true that you condemn thousands of health uh, of care home residents to death through bad policy? 
So uh, it's a bit too much uh, heat and not enough light. And I just picked that as one example of uh, an issue that it, the specialist correspondence would have had a different angle on. Yes, I think there was always a, a discussion in newsrooms, particularly about where you as a health correspondent might have been trying to temper down some of it or saying we need to ask more questions about that data. I mean, there are quite a few um, questions that are coming up here, which which are, which are sort of very anti-media, I would say. And, and I think um, I would say this, of course, but um, not all the media behaves the same. And one here has said media have replaced empathy with total hostility. And I, I would say I'm not sure that I have, and I don't think uh, Robin has for instance. Um, but there is a question here about, um, oh, of course it goes immediately, I want to see it. Uh, why does the media assume, the media, uh, that events, e.g. number of deaths, are always due to human agency rather than uh, reasons of random rather than predicted or stochastic reasons? Do you know, David? Can you think, do you think that's what happens, that, that it could have been uh, and not something that just couldn't have possibly been predicted? Uh, uh, this is tricky, isn't it? Because I, 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 I'm partly one foot in the media camp and one foot in the medical camp myself. So I, I generally think that that's about news values in mainstream general media as opposed to specialist healthcare publications. And it's about what counts as a story, really, isn't it? Uh, and it's a story of human error has led to lots of pe people catching COVID in hospital or staff dying. It's a story of beds are running out and people are having to cancel operations. Whereas looking at things like geography, population density, socioeconomic depriv deprivation, genetics is less of an issue. But Ivan's better placed than me in a way to talk about some of those factors. But we know, for instance, that communities uh, that have done very badly often have multi-generational, multi-occupancy, old uh, housing stock in pockets of deprivation. And I think that's probably less well discussed, the kind of determinants of health inequalities, for instance. Uh, and you will have seen the pretty shameful attempt last week to blame the public in Bolton for not being vaccinated for outbreaks leading to hospitalisation in Bolton, where in fact, the areas with the lowest uptake of vaccination were London boroughs and not uh, places in Greater Manchester. But I think it, to me, it's about what counts as a news story in mainstream media, and it's not nuanced discussions about uh, public health. What do you think, Robin, about um, that working your way through that data? Because there are one of the, the issues that came out yesterday was um, this, this quite compelling vision of Dominic Cummings standing in the cabinet room with a whiteboard and uh, with uh, Simon Stevens, the head of the um, of NHS England, with bits of paper reading out the ICU um, numbers. Was it, was it difficult in the beginning um, to present the data um, and, and not, not for, an, and you know, whether it could have been predicted or random? I mean, how did you work your way through it? Um, well, uh, to begin with, with, with great difficulty, um, as did everybody else. I mean, picking up just on a couple of little points before I go on to that, um, you, you, you talk about how health and science uh, correspondents were sort of pushed off the job slightly uh, with COVID, but it has ever been thus. It's the same uh, with genetic modified crops, and it was the same with MMR and many other things. And I would say it's been less of a problem this time. We about the media is slowly learning a lesson. Um, I just sorry, I, I wanted to make that. And in terms of uh, the, the the issue of about whether this was looking for stories in human error and why we just look and think, think is it circumstances well i mean the whole story of what dominic cummings was talking about yesterday was is one that's been riddled with human error and this is why we're in we were in the position that we were in um and in terms of trying to assess the data as it was coming out um that was probably the hardest part of the job, but by April last year, it was quite clear just how, you know, just how bad it was. And it was quite clear by September to journalists anyway, um, who were taking advice from scientists that, you know, we should be very careful about easing lockdown and, and, and the issues of circuit breakers. 
Um, I uh, just want to come back to that point in some ways that David had made too about the fact that you um, that you know the the data the what was happening was sort of different on pre presented differently at local level. So there were more complex, very complex issues about your local population that was feeding into a national narrative. So how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, it was. Victoria, it's not, it was not an impossible. Uh, I think David David hit the nail on the head when um, you would often be talking about wider determinants, you'd be talking about historic um, inequalities, um, you'd be talking about the fact that these populations had not been invested in for a, a long time, but, but actually nobody wanted that story. Um, pe people wanted the story of, you know, um, what's your case rate, you know, um, and why is the case rate at that? Even sometimes disappointingly, not, not looking beyond that headline case rate number and saying, well, what does that mean? What does it mean for your population? What does it, what does it mean for your hospital? What's the hospital looking like? What's your, you know, there, there wasn't, it, it, it almost sat on its own uh, as, a, as, an, as an entity in itself to be commented on. Uh, and it was very, very difficult to move people into saying, asking the, well, the, the, the real why question, um, uh, because actually it felt like people didn't want to know about the fact that if you keep cutting services and, you know, and the money goes in one place and doesn't go in another place, this is what can happen. Uh, that, that bit, from a, as a public health person, I found incredibly frustrating. Um, but, but uh, as I said, people want a very simple uh, story in a simple line that, that doesn't have that, those sorts of complexities in it. What have we learned about how this is a question that's come from Jill Grimshaw? What have we be, what have we learned about how local public health directors can make a difference locally in the face of such central control of the message? I mean, it's slightly what you've talked about, but maybe you could expand on that. At the beginning of this, it felt uh, as if public health directors were, were cut out of the story. Um, uh, the, 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 the conversation that was, was being had, which was, look, to understand the population that is local uh, and, uh, and to set up a response that's appropriate, you need to be talking to, you know, uh, the local health system, you know, not just directors of public health, you know, but particularly you need to be able to do that. I think as time has gone by, We've seen, you know, directors of public health being brought more to the fore of, of those conversations. But I think those have been sort of hard fought battles to get to that, to that place. Um, uh, and so I think that we are learning, but we could have learned a lot quicker. And, we, and I think we, there's still areas that we think, and I think the, the, the situation on, 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 on Tuesday was a, a prime example of saying, well, actually, if you had spoken to us beforehand, we could have explained to you that's not going to fly. And actually, we are always balancing risk here. Are we going to get more of a benefit from that piece of advice than a cost? Because what we ended up having was a very, very anxious population who were revisiting, you know, trauma, really traumatic uh, idea of having been in lockdown for so long that we were about to be tipped back into that situation again. Far more damaging than any kind of benefit that would have been derived from the advice that was being proffered. So I think it's things like that that you just need to talk to, to directors about, and we still need to do that better, clearly. Well, there was such a long time on the test and trace, wasn't there, of saying, why aren't you involving um, public health directors, the people who know their population the best, to try and trace the people that need to be traced. I mean, that was that that discussion seemed to go on for months and months and months before there was even a sign that uh, that you should be involved in the in the test and trace system. There's one here, David, um, for you that Sage should, in principle, be offering confidential advice to the government. Far too many members have chosen to voice their opinions to the media in breach of this confidentiality. The media, in turn, leap on the resulting controversy with glee to generate a good story. <laughs> well, the the media are constantly trying to find talking heads to put up on shows, and often they get 
people who are inexpert. One can think of the Toby Youngs of this world, you know, people with, who don't actually have relevant content expertise. Uh, so it's inevitable that people from Sage get approached and it will usually caption or they'll usually say in the intro that uh, they're speaking on their own behalf and not on behalf of Sage. And we have had calls, which I support for more transparency. If you remember back in the spring 2020, they had to be pushed to na name the members of Sage and to release the minutes publicly. Uh, I mean, so I think on balance, I'd rather these people were out in the open uh, and available to the media, as long as they distance what they say uh, from the advice of Sage itself, and as long as the Sage minutes are published. But I think I think it's a fair point. It could lead to a divide and rule if it looks like they're not agreeing with each other. The, the argument has always been, hasn't it, is that Sage, once we did know who they were, and um, and Dominic Cummings said he pushed for the more openness, and, and certainly um, Patrick Valance, the, the chief science, scientific advisor, uh, was was an open door on this one, that, they sh that it should be better known, um, but that there needs to be a a degree of um, confidentiality because of the complexity of the decisions being made and the different sources that that's coming from. Well, I, I think that that's true. I, mean, I, I worked in Whitehall in the civil service for several years when I was the national director for older people. And obviously you don't want every bit of confidential advice on, on risk uh, publicly available in, in real time. But on balance, uh, I think we need more transparency, not less transparency, to restore public confidence and to adhere to Nolan principles. Um, so I understand there are risks, but I think that you know the counterfactual of keeping all that advice suppressed isn't helpful. But of course, the real conversations, as Dominic Cummings implied yesterday, do you remember he corrected uh, the question and said not the not in cabinet but in the cabinet room. The real conversations are often unminuted and happen outside of the formally minuted meetings anyway, don't they? But uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of call at the moment for a public inquiry, isn't there? And the public inquiry won't report for two or three years. Right here, right now, we know 85% of what we need to know because of National Audit Office and good investigative journalism and reports from uh, the think tanks. And there's bound to be a lot of blame blame shifting. I would like to know in real time which bits of government policy were based on the scientific advice and which bits were based on the politicians overruling or ignoring the advice. And I don't think we should have to wait three years to find out. And fundamentally, senior government medics and scientists are in highly paid and prestigious roles, uh, able to monetize that role when they've left. And I think it should go with a territory that you are, you, your advice is, is able to be scrutinized and shared publicly and you're accountable for it. I, I saw lots of nodding from you there, Robin. I mean, do you agree with this? Absolutely. I, well, that was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I wish I'd said that. Um, and, uh, I mean, yes. Uh, it, at this rate, we won't get a uh, result of inquiry for until after the next general election. And we, who knows what other pandemics could re reach us before then. We need to we need to learn the lessons and make those lessons public and we have to hold the people who overrode what the scientists were saying uh, for incorrect political reasons um, to account. I couldn't think, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Absolutely fantastic. What did you yeah. think every time you heard the, uh, we're following the science, we're following the science? Um, I was looking to see if his nose got longer and longer. Um, quite you know, clearly, yeah, yeah, he didn't. Uh, yeah. um, and it's only in very last few last few months um, that we've seen any signs that, that this government has listened to scientists adequately. And it will remain to be seen um, just how much the uh, hospitalizations and case study numbers. Uh, rise and will it? How will they, that affect the June twenty first final lifting of lockdown? Will they have the nerve if things look a bit grim to hold that back? Um, I have my I have my doubts, as they say. We've got while well, I've got you here too. There's another question here that says the daily reporting of COVID cases and deaths. Do you think that the that the the daily reporting and I know this this wasn't what you were doing obviously on the Observer, but do you think that 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 was in any way useful? Um, yes, I do think it was useful. It shows you the 
the progress of, of well, nothing else, how well the vaccinations have done. It has sh and shown how uh, how badly affected that we were. Um, I, I can't see any. I can't see any harm in it. Sorry. No, I mean, my view is, and of course, at televisions, you're doing this, um, and the daily newspapers, rather, of, rather than the Sundays. But the, but my view was, it was, it was the, the clearest way we could show, for instance, the COVID deniers, that the death rates were going up, that hospitals were under pressure. Uh, and then the good news did come with the vaccination. So it was sort of, there's almost a damned if you did and damned if you didn't on that question. Yes, uh, well, you know, I mean, that's, oh, what are you supposed to do? I suppose it's a bit like the Second World War, and you're not supposed to admit to how many people were killed yeah. in bombing raids or something. They might have a, that might have effect morale, but that wasn't an issue here. As you say, rising death numbers is quite clearly very important in keeping uh, COVID deniers on the back foot. Um, and if they had their way, things would have been an awful lot worse. So I, I, I think it's, yeah, again, I defend it. Um, the, the next question that, that's risen up the list is there's, there is a significant number of yeah. people in our local community who have, who have for their own personal re reasons, decided to wait before being vaccinated, uh, e.g. for further research or statistics. Dominant occupations are mainly agricultural, fishing and tourism. Many families have several generations living locally, virtually all Caucasian. They are very nervous of sharing their anxieties due to the unpleasant response received. Are we missing a trick here? Well, I'm interested to know, um, Ivan, of course, is about this narrative about vaccine hesitancy and whether it is truly hesitancy or if it's the wrong question being asked and how you try and get a message through to a population that isn't watching the national media, isn't listening necessarily or reading the local papers. What, what do you do in that instance? Yeah, I think, I think Victoria, the, the term, I think I, I, it's, it's sometimes unhelpful. We, we, we do try to talk about vaccine confidence because a lot of people are simply not confident. Uh, and certain communities, particularly, and I, you know, not trying to be, um, you know, melodramatic about it, but certain communities have felt that um, they've not really been well engaged in the past with, 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 you know, health services or with, and they all, all into the, the, you know, the criminal justice system, all of those things make people nervous about what you're saying. You're saying this is for my best interest, but actually my, my, my historic, uh, recollections and my historic experiences are that you know society don't necessarily do things in my best interest uh, therefore um, you know I'm going to hold fire because I cannot take your word for it and that's why I, I speak about that issue about about public trust um, and in communities we you know we we, we, we have to work with communities uh, to be able to use voices that they they know and recognize, but I also feel that there is, that this has to be a way of changing the, the nature of that dialogue that we have, changing the way of that, that, that discussion that we have with communities. Um, so that we're not always not, we don't just knock on the door when we say we, we require something from you. Uh, and that's, and, to, and people will not be confident until we can have a meaningful conversation with them and then trust us. It's, it's interesting too, and it's about what people see, don't they? I mean, this is completely uh, away from the UK, but I was reporting from Liberia in um, end of March, and they were they were being described as vaccine hesitant about the COVAX delivery, but they actually hadn't seen COVID in their community. They were they were right up there for Ebola vaccination because they'd seen the Ebola. So it it, it is about the question. Is it, it's about how you ask the question, uh, do you want to have this vaccine or not? You know, what are your concerns rather than blaming, it felt to me, communities. I want to ask um, Robin, there's another question here about um, many of the reports of case death and vaccination rates from other European countries were wildly distorted, sometimes blatantly wrong and often appeared to be used for political point scoring. What kind of measures put in place by journalists to report more accurately? And I'm, I'm just going to add more accurately on that particular point. 
Well, I mean, the, the first and most, we have a re very strong reader's ed editorship uh, here in, in, in the Observer and the Guardian, and if you get something wrong, it's publicly admitted um, to, to be so. Um, I, I don't... I don't accept that there was any at the Guardian or the Observer or any wildly misleading uh, reporting of cases, and I'm not sure I recognise uh, uh, any particular particular glaring examples in the UK press. Um, perhaps you can think of something, Victoria. I, I'm not sure. I suppose the, what I thought then was that um, what we had to do and say, so there's always been this, you know, we've got the worst death rate, we've got the whatever, and it was always pointed out, which I thought was perfectly yeah. legitimate, that different countries have different ways of measuring their death rates. Uh, we have a very good um, um, death certification um uh, ways of measuring um, and the ONS and so on, which some countries did, which may don't, which made it more difficult. But um, I think most journalists I saw were pretty good at pointing out that that measuring it was was slightly more difficult. But you also had um, you also had the WHO's own um, graphs. You had um, the John Hopkins University graphs. So you weren't just taking it from uh, other country data, but you know, it was a difficult comparative issue. I mean, David, what do you think about that? Yeah, the question really is that there was some concern about us comparing our death rates or our infection rates with other countries and whether that was legitimate. And in some ways, did it feed into, uh, you know, um, this, this whole idea of making the, the uh, public more anxious? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's clear that each country uh, classifies and counts and compiles uh, death stats and admission data and prevalence and incidence in a slightly different way. So you could argue that you were comparing apples with oranges. For instance, Belgium was always getting hit as a very high death rate, but what, you know, whether Belgium's suffering quite so much as is being represented. I think closer to home, we had the unfortunate thing of two or three different parallel lots of reporting from our own government where you've got the ONS data that are based on what's recorded on death certificates uh, and the government had to be pushed quite hard uh, at the press briefings to talk about deaths outside hospital for the first few weeks and then you've got the device of deaths within 28 days of a positive test which actually underestimates the real number of uh, uh, certified deaths but enables you to give real-time data I suppose, again, if I'm thinking about if you go into the specialist health and science um, media, there's lots of explainers uh, around uh, whether we're comparing like with like. But I think in the mainstream media outside of specialist long reads from specialist correspondents, there's probably limited appetite, isn't there, for stories about whether the Swedes and the the Dutch and the Canadians count their death rates in exactly the same way. But I think by common consensus, We've not had uh, a good war in terms of the number of people who died, the care home deaths, uh, the pressure on acute hospitals compared to some other countries who took different measures. And I, I think that what's really interesting to me is what can we learn from countries uh, with relatively similar demographics who had a better, more successful pandemic overall than we did? Uh, what implications are there for future uh, novel viruses or another surge of COVID? The problem I had with comparatives was getting um, messages from my family in New Zealand saying, oh, my God, we've got another case. We're going to lock down. <laughs> it's like, yes, you can just leave it, leave it there. We're not going to discuss that. I wanted to ask you, Ivan, we're going to have to wrap up very soon, but I just wanted to ask you, Ivan, too. I mean, the world has become expert on data and statistics and so on. It felt like... Um, Fortunately, we couldn't have any dinner parties or go to any drinks do's during this period because it would have been bombarded with people who'd made, done their own analysis. Um, but how difficult is it for you as the director of public health to explain some of these quite complex numbers? So, so I think that that has been a challenge. And I, we have evolved in that. And I'm, and I'm hoping that public health in general has evolved in that. Because I think, you know, we, we have this love of data and, you know, uh, and, and particularly making it as statistically complex as we possibly can. Um, and I think having to, to draw back and say, what is the message that we are trying to get through? 
how do we make this simple? And what are the key, what are the two or three key indicators that people really need to know? And strip back the rest. A lot of that is it's great for research and it's great for our own understanding. But what people want to know is what does this look like in, in my area? What level of risk I'm at? And if I need to go to the, the GP or to the hospital, am I going to be able to get in there? Um, and so real, really trying to, to localize those numbers. Context is important, of course, but also comparing like for like. So, so for a city like Leicester, often people say, well, the national, the national uh, average is X. And we say, well, but we're not. And there's nothing about this city that is national average. Um, so having the right comparators to say, this is what we look like, very much to the point that David made actually, which is, you know, being able to, 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 to look at things through the context of saying, what is a reasonable comparator here? Um, so we've had to learn to do that uh, along the way. And I, and I hope that continues for lots and lots of other areas that are post COVID. Do you think, Robin, that uh, that, that um, there has been a, a learning curve for you in the way that you present the data and the numbers? I mean, you, your pieces are always so fantastically interesting and you explain it so well. But do you think that, that that's changed in a way because you, you realise so many more people are hanging off those numbers? Yes, I, I take your point. I'm certainly more sure of my audience now. Um, I'm more confident that they're going to be, will accept a piece of complexity that perhaps they would not have accepted before um, because this this affair is so directly involves their lives. Um, I think it makes me more confident that uh, I, I, you know, I don't have to simplify perhaps as much as I, I, I used to do. Um, but again, I I'm blessed by the scientists who explain it so well and have made it so easy. Um, uh, but I think, you know, people go to more, young people want to be scientists, but I think more and more, and more young people are more likely to want to be statisticians now, uh, statisticians, I should say. Um, it's been a fascinating, uh, fascinating process. Do you think more people are going to want to be doctors, David, after this, or do you think the whole thing will have put them off? <laughs> Uh, well, there has been an upsurge in applications to uh, nursing courses and to medical school. And there is already a plan, of course, to expand medical school places in the UK. So uh, I, I, I can imagine younger pe people watching what's going on would be uh, possibly attracted towards medicine. Yeah, but um, I think you've got another issue, which is that the people who are in existing members of the workforce are quite tired and quite stressed and quite burnt out and the impact of immigration policy and the mood music around Brexit isn't going to help really. So I think, you know, what, what as I've written in a, in a few different outlets, what the pandemic's done is expose some underlying structural problems and fault lines that those of us in the sector knew to be there already, like lack of capacity uh, in hospitals, like workforce gaps, like social care funding, uh so uh, yeah but i think it will draw some people in but i'm more worried about the here and now of how we keep the people we've got i think that's a very good point actually um and didn't come out at all th during yesterday's session is actually the the human cost of what's happened they talk about the 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 you know tens and thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people affected but they didn't actually really talk about you know what it feels like to be a relative what it felt like to be a doctor on the front line um you know it missed from the political um points i'm going to do a terrible tv journalistic thing now to all three of you is in one sentence if you can i want you to sum up what the last, as Robin says, the last 18 months now. What, so for you, David, can you sum up in just one sentence what it's been like? It's very fashionable to knock journalism and to knock mainstream media. But if it hadn't been for skilled professional uh, reporting and investigative journalism, we wouldn't know half as much as we do, and we wouldn't have held uh, the government or officials to account, and we'd know, know a lot less. And I'd rather get my information from people like Victoria McDonald or Robin McKee than from grifters on social media with Patreon accounts or people who think they know a lot more than they do. So keep up the good work. So beautifully put, I'm tempted to leave it there, but so, Robin, what about you? I go back to what I said before, that uh, there is a 
an appetite for people to un, to to face complex issues um, and not to be afraid to take time and effort to put it as clearly as possible over to them. So it's 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 opened my eyes uh, as a working journalist in that sense. Well, we're very grateful for the work you do, um, Ivan. Last word. Uh, I, I think that for, for me, it has been. Uh, a time of reflection, it's been relentless. Uh, but what I think it has done is indicate how important the role of communication is for the Director of Public Health. I, I think previously we sort of sat in back offices, but actually I see this as a working with, with the media as a core part of my job. And we're very grateful to you as well, of course. Um, you, it must have been relentless. Um, well, it has. It's been relentless for everybody. And I think this, this, um, there's a sort of almost a catharsis to sessions like this when you all get together and talk about really what it's been like for you over the past months and year or so. I, I can't believe that it's 18 months. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit sorry that there still remains this um, this. Uh, idea of putting all the media into one into one group because I think it's a very disparate group and there are there are people who try very hard and there are those who um, have a political agenda as is ever thus out there but this has been an enormously helpful and interesting um, panel discussion and I'm very grateful to all of you for your ideas um, can I thank you all very much for attending? And before you all go, the audience, can I just mention that uh, the next session on um, 8th of July, uh, no, there is a session on the 8th of July called Spotlight on Long COVID. Now, this will be a three hour episode, uh, extended length, and it is paid for, um, but focusing on an incredibly important issue that right back there in January or February, nobody knew was coming our way. But thank you very much to all of you for taking the time.